Okay, so uh, I'm Mike Douglas, and this is the New Technologies and Mathematics Seminar of the CMSA at Harvard University. And today we're delighted to have David McAllister from the Toyota Technological Institute at Chicago, who will speak on uh, type theory from the point of view of artificial intelligence. David has been working on AI and mathematics along with machine learning for a very long time. In fact, his thesis and uh, he'll tell us how how the two things fit together. Uh, David. Yeah. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, we've got a pretty small group today, so um, uh, I'm going to try to make this as interactive as possible, and I don't really know um, people's backgrounds, so I'll try to stop and get some discussion going just so we're sure we're all on the same page. So I'm fundamentally an AI person. I care about, uh, I've all, my whole career has been, you know, many different topics, but always uh, my emotional attachment is to the concept of artificial intelligence and AGI. And uh, I, I became interested in the foundations of mathematics as part of my PhD work. Um, and I've gotten interested in it again. Uh, and what I'm gonna to try to do today is uh, look at type theory from the perspective of artificial intelligence. Um, so uh, I, I wanna talk about three motivations um, that I have for studying type theory. And one of them is uh, sort of a linguistics motivation. And I'll talk about this on the next slide in more detail, but um, there's colloquial language in mathematics. Mathematicians have um, uh, the language they use in, in natural language. And that language uh, seems to have a very um, specific concrete grammar. I'll talk about this later. So I'm interested in, in understanding type theory as a model of the colloquial language of mathematics. Also, there's an engineering motivation. I'm gonna focus on um, semantic definitions. And the idea is if we define the type theory semantically rather than by inference rules, that gives us a kind of freedom to design arbitrary sound um, inference algorithms. And I don't know how many, uh, how many of the people here are um, sort of well-versed in type theory, but um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, the details of what I'm calling Bourbaki type theory and how that fits into Martin Loft type theory and other models of type theory. Um, there's this thing called the groupoid model, and Bur the Bourbaki model is similar in that it focuses on isomorphism but differs in various ways. So I want to get some discussion going, um, especially when we get to that part. Okay, isomorphism. The idea behind isomorphism is that it's a central tool in human mathematical reasoning. So we have a strong intuition that two isomorphic groups are, quote, the same. Um, and for any isomorphic graphs, G and G prime, and a graph theoretic property, we have that that property holds of G if and only if it holds of G prime. Um, and most people, most mathematicians would, I think, especially if they're not trained in logic, they would think that the definition of graph theoretic is exactly this property, that if, if a property is graph theoretic, that means that it respects graph isomorphism. But I think it's clear um, to type theorists that graph theoretic is really a grammatical property. It's a property of, of the uh, grammatical expression that defines the property. And that's where type theory comes in. So the whole idea is that somehow the grammar of uh, math mathematical language, real human language, supports this substitution principle or this equivalence principle for uh, isomorphism. Um, and there's this subjective experience of isomorphism as a kind of superpower. Um, when we show that two things are isomorphic, we know that they're intersubstitutable and we don't feel a need to justify that substitution. Um, the, the lean theorem proving system uh, does allow one to um, manipulate and, and work with isomorphism, but it's 
uh, it's not built into the fundamental type theory of that system. Um, and the position I'm taking is that this support for the isomorphism superpower is really the motivation. It's the fundamental motivation for type theory. Type theory sort of um, by providing this uh, principle, by providing abstract interfaces and the notion that two things can be equivalent through their abstract interface, um, we, we gain a very powerful inferential principle, the substitution of isomorphism. Um, so in mathematics, uh, I wanna talk about three fundamental equalities, equality relations of mathematics. Um, set theoretic equality, uh, we're familiar, if you're familiar with the Zernola Frankel set theory, there's um, set theory takes a notion of equality as primitive. Then you have isomorphism between structures. And there's also Birkhoff and Rhoda's notion of cryptomorphism between uh, classes of structures. And the idea here is that any form of equality is important from an engineering perspective. Um, equality supports congruence closure. Um, so it's very algorithmically, any form of equality is, is algorithmically significant. Okay, so um, what I'm calling Bourbaki type theory, I'm gonna develop it as a type discipline over ZFC. So this is actually similar to lean, um, the lean theorem proving system. Um, so we have some universe V of sets, that's a model of zermelo frankel set theory. I like to think of there being a standard model, sort of a set theoretic realism. And the set class distinction um, is going to be central to this uh, type theory built over set theory. Um, and I'm also gonna work with a semantic, uh, so type theory is typically presented, Martin Loft type theory is typically presented as a set of inference rules. But I'm gonna to try to define it here semantically. And the next three slides, um, I feel are fairly trivial. Um, so these are intentionally trivial. Um, and the, the question that has sort of dogged me for many years is why there's so much resistance in the type theory community to these trivial, but to me, completely appropriate definitions. Um, so I'm gonna define some constructs of type theory. Um, so we, what we're gonna have is, is pair types, the type of pairs. We're gonna have function types, the type of functions. And we're going to have a way of constructing subtypes by, by taking a subtype satisfying some property. So up here, this is the, the um, type theoretic notation for a dependent pair type. So this is the set of pairs whose first element is an element of this set. I'm assuming S is a set. And I'm also assuming given an element of S, I can define a set that depends on that element. So this might have to satisfy some property involving that element. So this is the set of pairs such that the first thing is in S and the second thing is in U of X. Um, and this similarly is the set of functions that takes something in this set and returns a value in the set U of X. And, and down here, we can construct, if we've got a set S and, uh, and I can make a statement about the elements of S, then I can construct the subset. And the idea here is that this semantics should be enough. In first order logic, for example, first order logic is defined semantically. Um, and I mean, you, you, of course there's a proof theory, but when you go to design inference algorithms, you can do anything that you want to do to set to, as long as it's sound under the semantics. Also, mathematicians generally define notation by its meaning. So it seems perfectly appropriate to define notation by its meaning. So here are all the constructs that I'm gonna work with. Um, I'm just going to list them. And the point here is that every one of these constructs has an obvious, trivial, semantic definition of what it means, right? So bool is just the set of the two truth values. And you know, this is going to be true. This is the normal disjunction, the normal negation, the normal universal quantification. Um, this is going to be isomorphism. Uh, this is going to be set theoretic equality. Now, set theoretic equality uh, is a little special in that um, in its well-formedness condition. 
but I'll talk about that later. So, um, so these are the constructs. Each construct has an obvious semantics and a, a well-formedness condition. Um, you know, the, uh, the construct at the end there. Yeah, so the is going to be well formed if and only if there's only there's exactly one element of S satisfying this formula. Okay. Uh, so it's the definite description. Okay. Um, and so we have pairs. We can take the other projection of a pair. I can build a function with a lambda expression. I can apply a function. Um, and then we have uh, contexts and entailment. So a context is just going to be consist of a set of variable declar declarations and assumptions. So I can say, let alpha be a set, let X be an element of alpha, Y be an element of alpha, F a function from alpha to alpha. And then if I say X equals Y as an assumption, then it follows from that that F of X equals F of Y. So I'm using this double turnstile. I'm gonna use that double turnstile throughout because I'm focusing on semantic entailment. Um, so in general, if I've got a set of variable declarations and Boolean assumptions, there's going to be a set of variable interpretations that satisfy these declarations and assumptions. And then I, I'll write this, if every variable interpretation satisfying this context satisfies whatever this statement is. Um, okay, so do we have any type theorists in the audience? Um, I wanted to stop at this point and say, um, you know, I've had this frustration for decades that type theory involves something called the Curry Howard isomorphism. Um, and it's presented as these inference rules. And when, and when people describe the type primitives, they'll say, well, this would traditionally be thought of as a set of pairs, but um, what we're doing is, is somehow different from that. Um, does anybody want to jump in? And are there any type theorists in the audience? <laughs> I, I, I like the Curry Howard isomorphism. I mean, it, it, it's certainly elegant. It kind of collapses different definitions into the same. It, it does get. Um, I'm certainly not a type theorist, and I wouldn't maintain that it's a deep thing, but it's an elegant thing. Yeah. So that's that's the, that's a benefit of the Curry Howard isomorphism. Um, I think uh, there is a um, pedagogical issue here, right? When I first encountered type theory in the Curry-Howard isomorphism, um, I found it to be kind of a barrier because um, these expressions felt to me like they had an obvious meaning that was adequate. Okay. Um, for me, what motivates type theory? Why do we, oh, is there a raise, is there a question? Yeah, um, what do you think of the Curry-Howard-Lambeck isomorph or correspondence, uh, which tries to bring some category theory, um, maybe semantics, maybe something like what you're looking for? Well, I'm gonna avoid category theory. So the idea here is if you go to these constructs, um, I'm, I'm trying to be completely naive. And, and the question is, is there anything wrong with being completely naive? Am I making sense? I'm actually, I'm actually gonna avoid category theory and groupoids even, um, and, and just be completely naive here. You know, so naive means that this formula is true if for every element of this set, this formula is true. Um, okay, so um, what, why type theory? Why, are we, why does type theory exist? You know, why, what are we doing with type theory? Um, so for me, uh, uh, isomorphism sort of should be viewed as the motivation for type theory. So here's the, here's the substitution of isomorphics inference rule, right? It says that if I've got some class um, 
And if, if I assume that uh, for any element of the class sigma, that if I apply some, if I have some expression involving that, that's a tau, then I can, and I've got two things that are isomorphic as sigma, then I can substitute them and they're isomorphic as tau. And this rule is, is just, I could run congruence closure on that rule. That's a very uh, simple rule if I'm not too worried about keeping track of exactly what the isomorphism is, but I'll get, I'll talk about that later. Okay, I said that um, all expressions have to be well-formed and have well-formedness conditions. And for most of these expressions, if you look at this table of expressions, the well-formedness conditions are just sort of obvious. Um, uh, you know, uh, this is only gonna be well-formed if E denotes a pair. Um, so the idea is that most well-formedness conditions are obvious. There's one exception to that, and that is set theoretic equality. So what's going to make this whole thing work is a restriction on the, on the um, well-formedness of set theoretic equality. So for set theoretic equality, uh, for this to be well-formed, we're gonna require that there exists a set expression that the context, it, it's a, that it follows from the context that both of these are in that same set expression. And that's the, um, this is the well-formed in this condition that makes the isomorphism substitution rule work. Um, if you think of a colored graph, or you think of, um, if you think of two groups, and I wanna ask if an element of this group is, the, is set theoretically equal to some element of that group, then if I take, uh, if I replace one of those groups by an isomorphic group, that's going to change the value of that equality. So that might give you some intuition as to why this is an important um, constraint. Um, okay, functors. So a functor is a function between uh, classes. And I'm gonna take a, uh, um, a particular view of functors as macros. So um, there's a problem with functions between classes or higher level functions. Consider a predicate. If I want to take a, a predicate on groups, if I define that to be naive, if I define that naively as just any predicate, then that predicate will can, if I consider an arbitrary predicate, distinguish between isomorphic groups. So I can't just take uh, the type of predicates to be naively all functions on groups. Um, so what, what works is uh, to work with macros. So macros, what I mean, so a macro is just saying, I'm gonna, you can think of a functor as being um, uh, an, so a functor say from topological spaces to groups is a, is a group expression with a topological space variable in it. And so I can define a macro, a, a lambda expression that takes uh, a topological space and constructs a group. But you want to think of that as just a semantic, as, as a syntactic substitution. So at higher universes, um, we'll just use a term model. So um, at higher, at, 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 as, you, as you go from functors and you might want func you know, macros that take macros as arguments and a whole type system up there. Um, but those expressions are going to strongly normalize, beta reduce down to um, elements of the universe of sets or classes, and they're going to preserve well-formedness. So all you need, you don't need to talk about, I mean, you, you can talk about groupoid semantics um, at the higher levels, but all you really need is to say that there's a term model semantics up there, that, every, that up there, everything is just a term and all application is just syntactic substitution. And you prove a subject reduction theorem that whenever you beta reduce something, you um, uh, preserve its type. Um, and, and, and so you can get, get, get a, a macro language above the sets um, that includes functors just by using a term model semantics. So this is a very different view, I think, from the way um, the universe sequence, the higher, the higher universes are viewed in Martin Loft type theory. Here, I'm just viewing them as, as 
having a term, having a explicit term model semantics. And I'm going to write applications of functors with square brackets just to emphasize that this is just syntactic substitution. Right, so at the higher at the higher universes, everything is syntactic substitution. You have strong normalization, but once you're down in the sets, um, you have semantic functions. Like if I say consider a C infinity function on the unit interval, that's a semantic function. That's not a lambda expression. So once you're down at the level of sets, function application is is not just syntactic substitution, um, because the the functions are richer than just uh, lambda terms. Cryptomorphism. So I said there were three fundamental notions of um, equality uh, in mathematics, right? There's set theoretic equality, which, which is primitive in set theory. Um, and there's isomorphism, which is associated with a class. Um, and uh, there's cryptomorphism. So cryptomorphism fundamentally involves this notion of functor. Um, so I, if I've got two functors, one from sigma to tau, and one from tau to sigma, and these would just be lambda expressions. Um, and, and we have that they're inverses of each other. Then we will call these two classes, sigma and tau, cryptomorphic. So again, this is done without category theory. It's just using a term model for the functors. And it's saying that if there exists a term, if there exists a functor, a lambda expression with this property, then they're cryptomorphic. Now, this equality could be replaced with isomorphism, and you would get a slightly different notion of a weaker, uh, a weaker notion of cryptomorphism. But here, I'm just going to work with um, these being uh, inverses up to set theoretic equality. Okay, so um, now I'm going to shift gear. Maybe I should should stop here and say if there are any type theorists in the audience, it's, if they want to object to this sort of, again, I'm sort of making things trivial on purpose. The, the idea here is that trivial is good. Um, Can I ask a question? Question? Yes. Um, so when you're talking about functors, you talked about uh, beta reduction preserving its type. So presumably you're going to have some theorems saying that every object has a type. Right. Every object has a unique type. No, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to come to that in a minute. That's just. Oh, okay. I object to that. But anyway, <laughs> every if you, if you have an object and a type that it's in, and you do a beta reduction, it remains in that type. Okay, I'll, I'll hold on. Okay. Okay, so I am trying. You know, when I was. Um, Starting graduate school, there was all this stuff with non-monotonic logic, and I did some stuff based on Boolean logic, and everybody felt that it was trivial, and I felt that, okay, it's trivial, but it's the right thing. So that's my, <laughs> I believe in trivial. Um, Bourbaki key type theory. So now I'm going to start um, getting more into the type theory. So in Martin Loft type theory, um, when two things are equal, that means that there's, a, there's this identity type that's inhabited. And in Bourbaki type theory, I mean, I'm going to be like the groupoid model. I'm going to interpret this identity type as the set of isomorphisms between them. So what, what's going to happen here is that um, set theoretic equality is going to correspond to some so-called judgmental equality in Martin Loft type theory. And uh, propositional equality is going to correspond to isomorphism. So this is going to be a model where propositional equality is isomorphism, and this identity type is going to be the set of isomorph of sigma isomorphisms from n to n prime. Um, so that's similar. Interpreting propositional equality as isomorphism was done in the groupoid model back in '95. Uh, the difference here is that um, the particular representation of isomorphism that I'm going to use is based on the 1930s Bourbaki definitions. Is a, is a direct generalization of the 1930s definition. Again, trying to be trivial. Um, uh, so what, what happens is we get a different representation of isomorphism in the Bourbaki model than in the groupoid model. Also, the Bourbaki model is going to be fully internalized, meaning um, 
uh, you have inference principles that fully handle isomorphism. Um, now, I'll, you know, I'll just say, I see no AI or linguistics motivation for homotopy type theory. So I'm not going to discuss hot. Um, it, 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 you know, it may be important for homotopy theory, but I don't see um, an AI motivation for it, for making inference more effective. Um, okay, signature axiom class expressions. What do we mean by a class? What is a concept in mathematics? Um, so a concept such as group or topological space, I wanna argue is uh, defined by what I'm gonna call a signature axiom class. So a signature axiom class, I'm, I'm gonna write it in the notation of type theory. But when I define a group, for example, I say a group, it consists of a set of group elements. And I wanna think of that as, think of this as a first order model, as a model of first order logic. So if you have a model of first order logic, there's some universe of discourse. And um, that's often called a sort. And you can have multi-sorted models of first order logic. So in general, I wanna allow a multi-sorted concept. So you might have a colored graph where the nodes of the graph are one sort and the colors are a different sort. So uh, uh, a signature axiom class is going to have a set of sorts, a sequence of sorts. Then it's going to have a, 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 a signature. The signature is going to say, so for example, a group, the signature of a group is going to be a group that consists of the set of group elements, um, some identity element, some inverse operation and some group operation. And that, um, so I can write here, I can say it's a tuple of an identity element, um, an inverse operation and a group operation satisfying the group properties. So, uh, and this, if I'm being naive, this is just something that's true or false, right? So this is defining a subset, um, a subset of the things of this signature that satisfy the group axioms. You can also define a group as consisting just of the group operation, um, such that the identity element and the inverse operation exist. Uh, or, or identity element and inverses exist, um, in which case the signature would just be the group operation. And then this would be a subtype of magmas that just have a, a group operation. But an important point here is being completely naive in, in mathematics, the notion of isomorphism is determined by the signature independent of the axioms, right? So when I define what, a, uh, what it means for two topological spaces to be homeomorphic, Really, that definition applies to anything whose signature is a set of points and a family of subsets, right? And they're isomorphic if there exists a bijection between their points that identifies the subsets. So it, it does not depend on the axioms. Um, so somehow these axioms are different in the way they interact with isomorphism from um, elements of this signature. Uh, so in, in two, so the first thing to note or to prove is that every class expression, so now we've got this language in which we have class expressions, the, the language of things you can build out of these constructors, these primitives, and the claim is that every class expression is cryptomorphic to a signature axiom class. You can always construct a cryptomorphism. So this seems to, at least that makes it, um, at least that provides a rationale for saying we can focus on, and maybe this is why mathematics seems to focus on this notion of a signature axiom definition of a concept. Um, okay, so let's talk about the colloquial uh, definition of isomorphism. So I, I like this word colloquial. It's sort of, you know, what do mathematicians, what does mathematical language look like? What does mathematics look like? Especially if we're not, for if we're looking talking about mathematicians who were never trained as logicians so it's just the natural language that they use so anyway i like this word colloquial um so if we consider a signature axiom class like this and we consider two instances of it an instance of the signature axiom class is going to consist of a, a particular sets for the sorts or if it's only one sort a particular set for the sort and an object that is of the type given by the signature of that class, right? So um, and the elements of this class are pairs. 
Note that I'm not including, so in Martin Loft type theory, if I had this class, you would actually include in, as fields in the structure um, proofs of these properties, and I'm not doing that. Um, I'm just being more naive. That's just true or false. I'm just getting a subset. Um, okay, so I've got, so Bourbaki is, defines isomorphism to be a bijection between the universes, between the sorts, or between the corresponding sorts that carries this object to that object. Um, and so we have this notion of carrying. And in, a, in practice, in mathematics, the signature is almost always a simple type. It's almost always built out of the sorts using just arrow and cross, arrow for function space and cross for product space. And, and all, this, all the work goes into the axioms. Um, so in the case where the signature axiom class uh, has a simple signature, you can just, the notion of isomorphism is just, is, is essentially trivial. And again, I'm trying to be trivial, right? So, um, uh, the, the function is going to carry a pair by carrying each component. The function is going to, if, if, so, if, it's, if this is an element of a sort, the function is just the identity, the function is just gets applied, just carries the elements of the sort. Um, and the, the, the function will carry functions um, in such a way that a certain commutative diagram is satisfied. Um, so functions are naturally carried by carrying each input output pair as if it was a pair. Um, so that's basically, uh, when I've given talks on this before, I, I didn't make, you know, make it clear, I think, that there's this trivial notion of isomorphism. Um, so, uh, so now I'm going to be sort of into type theory. Um, I've said that in this type theory, in Bourbaki type theory, um, these identity types are isomorphisms. Now, in colloquial mathematics, the isomorphism, the thing that is the isomorphism is the bijection, right? An isomorphism is a bijection that carries blah, 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 that satisfying, you know, that carries the graph edges to the graph edges or the open sets to the open sets. So um, the thing that is the uh, isomorphism is an identity is a, is a is a system of bijections between the sorts. So when I write, if I write set to the end here, then it's this has a very well defined meaning. It's just all bijections between uh, the sorts here and the corresponding sorts there. Um, and now for a signature axiom class, we're going to define uh, the isomorphisms between elements of that class to be the bijections between the sorts that carry x to x prime. And in Martin Loft type theory, there's this operator derived from J called subst. And uh, in, in standard Martin Loft type theory, this, this is just a way of, of uh, justifying substitution of equals for equals. But in this setting where propositional equality is isomorphism, this is going to have a carrying meaning, right? So subst of uh, subst, which is taking this isomorphism and this signature, um, and uh, the subst operation is going to carry an element of the signature to its its correspondence under this mapping from A to A prime. So Bourbaki says an isomorphism is a bijection that carries the structure. Here, the carrying operation is done by subst. Um, and here we're going to define, we're going to generalize this subs to dependent type theory. But this subs operation, this is a, this is a, now a macro that takes a set to a type. Um, up here, this is a macro that takes the set alpha to a type. Um, and the, the subs operation is going to actually end up being a bijection from uh, the type over the set A and the type over the set A prime. I hope this isn't getting too technical. Um, I wanna get back to Tom's question. Um, okay, so um, this generalization in, in, in Bourbaki's definition of carrying 
there's just this case analysis over the type expression. The type expression is either bool or a sort or, or a cross product or an arrow. You can do that same case analysis in the, in the presence of um, dependent types. Um, and I probably don't wanna go through this in too much detail, but what's happening is that um, we need to define this carrying operation um, when the type when the type S depend, is dependent, right? It depends on more structure than just the set A, because as we recurse into types, we're going to get dependent types, and on the recursive call, those dependent types are going to depend on additional structures. So this carry is going to take the function, which is just the bijection, and some additional structure that S can use. So S here is is gets a type a set that's a function of both the carrying set and some object. Um, and then subst is defined in terms of carry. And here's just an example of carrying. You wanna carry um, at a dependent pair type. And the only point I wanna, this is a dependent pair type. So this is a type of pairs where the type of the second component of the pair depends on the value of the first component. And the only point I wanna make here is that when you define the carrying operation, um, you're gonna carry the first component based on the type of the first component. And you're gonna carry the second component based on a type that's looking at the first component. So you wanna take, um, you wanna make this first component of the pair available <clears throat> um, in defining the type of, uh, of, the, of the second component. Okay, so this is for type theorists, I guess. Um, the computational content of substitution. So um, we're substituting isomorphics for isomorphics. The principle of substitution of isomorphics is going to say that um, is, is basically this. If I've got a functor from sigma to tau, and I've got two things in sigma that are isomorphic. So what does it mean for them to be isomorphic? It means there exists uh, an isomorphism between them. So this is going to be a bijection between their sorts that carries n to n prime. Um, and if I want to prove, what I want to prove is that uh, g of n in this setting is isomorphic to g of n prime. So I actually have to construct an isomorphism between the sorts of G of N and the sorts of G of N prime that is an isomorphism here. So that's a kind of, comp that's a kind of constructive proof of the uh, substitution of isomorphics. You actually construct the isomorphism. Um, and this, this is um, probably more technical than I want, than I should be getting. Um, but the, uh, the basic idea is, let me go back to this slide. The basic idea is that the type tau has sorts. It's just, I'm gonna assume that it's also a, a signature axiom class. So tau has sorts. Like if I was mapping a topological space to a group, the sorts here would be the group elements and the group elements would be equivalence classes of homotopy paths. Um, and, uh, what I'm gonna to have to do is construct a, an iso, a, a bijection between the group elements that causes these two groups to be isomorphic. And the point is that um, that sort, that sort that's in this type uh, is being given a value by G. G is constructing the thing that's of type tau. So I can look into G and see the set and the carry operation carries elements of that set. So when I carry from the sort of end of the sort of n prime, I can carry, it's, it's defining a carry operation on the sort of tau. And that carrying operation is a bijection and that is the isomorphism. Probably everybody's gone to sleep. Okay, um, semantics for J. I should say that at this point, I'm perfectly happy with the type theory. I can go 
to build a theorem prover. Um, I have my semantics. I can design algorithms that are sound under the semantics. I understand all the three equality relations. I understand set theoretic equality. I understand cryptomorphism. I understand isomorphism. I've got computational content for isomorphism. I don't need anything else. However, um, if you want to say this is a model of MLTT, then you have to provide a semantics for J. J is this primitive in Martin Loft type theory. And frankly, I've, <laughs> I don't know if I should say this. I've always felt this was a kind of monstrosity. Um, and, uh, and I'm trying to be as trivial as possible, but it is possible now to give a semantics for J uh, consistent with, uh, basically I'm, giving a, I'm gonna give a semantics for J as a carrying operation. So I guess this slide is really intended for people who've seen J before. So David, can you tell us intuitively what J is supposed to be? So J is constructing um, an equality, uh, uh, J is generalizing properties of equality. So um, what people typically say is if, um, uh, if I've got some type, that uh, is true of equality. So this is some, some binary relation that is true of equality. Then you can generalize that to be true of pairs of things that are equal. And by equality, I mean identity. So if this is true and N and N prime are the same thing, then in the case N and N prime are different terms, but not equal, um, we get a proof of equality between them. It's often just, I'm, that's not very clear. I, um, I've, I've been thinking hard about the isomorphism interpretation of J, um, but I've never really understood why we need J as opposed to just the way equality is treated in first order logic. Um, but it is a, it's a way of treating equality that is, uh, saying that equality is the least relation containing the identity relation. So this is saying that any relation that contains the identity relation, um, uh, equality is true of that. Well, so it's a construction of an equality in, in, in some sense, a, a definition of equality, which is constructing it out of, as you say, the minimal set of possibilities. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so it's saying equality is the least, yeah. Okay. Um, might also be possible to understand this in terms of recording justifications. Um, but when equality is interpreted as isomorphism, then J can be defined semantically in terms of carrying. It's, it's just a form of carrying. Um, and uh, there's some subtleties here. If you're familiar with J, this F appears down here. Um, and there's a subtlety in that um, what happens is uh, this carrying operation carries the identity function to F if the, exactly the right type is provided. And so that's why F shows up here. Um, so Tom, here's your uh, uh, question about unique types. Um, so in mathematics, an abelian group is a group. And uh, if I have a group that happens to be an abelian, it is both a group and an abelian group. So when, when people say every term has a unique type, um, that always sort of stuck in my throat because what's meant by it, because I was, I have a naive interpretation of what the terms mean. And if I say, I'm talking, if this term denotes a group, then that group should be both in the type group and in the type abelian group if it happens to be abelian. Now, what happens in Martin Loft type theory is if I, the type abelian group actually has a, so let's say that the group is a pair 
of a set and a group operation. Um, now, if the group happens to be abelian, I can add a proof that it's abelian as another sort of record in the, or another component of the tuple. But it just seems wrong to me that just by observing that it's abelian, which it is or is not, given the pair, suddenly it turns into a triple, right? The, a, the group is both abelian, is both a group and an abelian group. And in, in Bourbaki type theory, something even more disturbing happens. Um, the same set theoretic object, the same value. So when they talk about term, I tend to think value. That term is going to have a value. And that value is going to be an element of the universe of sets. And what happens is the same value can have um, different signatures. And that's a much more profound difference than just um, being in, you know, having different, act, different classes with different axioms, all being subsets of each other. So this is an example where you get a different signature. So if I say alpha is a set and X is in alpha, then the pair alpha X is in this dependent pair type. It, the, it's, you know, it consists of a set beta and an element of beta, but it's also in set cross alpha. And these, these two types have different signatures and different notions of isomorphism. Now you can all, so you can always define a term to be a pair of, a, of what I would call a term that denotes an object and a type that specifies the type of that term. But so that's, you can always type tag the values. And then if you type tag the values, yes, every type tagged value has a unique type. Um, I, I take the general point, but remind us why the second thing's not, couldn't be defined just as a special case of the first. The, cross product or the pair is not just not well, what's going to happen here is that the notion of isomorphism associated with these are going to be different right anything isomorphic under this notion but, but, but why do i need the second notion why can't i just say it's kind of a trivial example of dependent type where um, you know the, the the actual type of the second thing doesn't depend so, so in, in in the general notion of a dependent pair type um you're going to have many occur so up here with a dependent pair type where this suppose this was some um simple type over so in general it depends but that does not to say that it has to depend exactly right I, i'm not sure maybe i'm not understanding your question why well, can't i just in this particular instance just not use the second definition and always replace it with this you know the, the first the, you know the special case of the first definition where beta actually doesn't depend so, um, so these are different type expressions. But, but why do I need the second one? Well, I mean, um, it says something different. So if you want to say that different thing, um, well, you maybe, you can use, maybe you can use it in more ways. Uh, like, I mean, I guess, uh, yeah. Uh, so in, in general, this beta could occur many times in the signature, right? Right. And some of the occurrences of beta you might want to bind here, and some of them you might want to have refer to other sorts. Yeah. And it could just happen that those other sorts are also um, in beta, right? It could, you, you could interpret those other, it's possible those other sorts and beta are actually the same. But you still might want to have free sorts here. Let me um, let me go to the case of free sort variables, right? So if consider this type, right? right? So you take a um, th this is so you to me this type corresponds to the type of multiset. Think of beta as an index set. So this is saying there's some set beta that and a function from beta to alpha. And that's going to define a number of occurrences of alpha under this function. Right. So it's important. So if so, I want to think of this as being bag of alpha. So there's a free type. So there's a free sort variable in this type. Now it's possible that alpha and beta are the same, although you, that would not be very natural. But it, but to say beta arrow beta is a different type from beta arrow alpha. 
you know, even in the case where they're the same, where the, where the, so it, I don't, I don't think this is terribly important, but um, it's, it's just, it's just a true fact of this system that the same value can be in different signatures. Well, I, I mean, the larger point, I mean, it seems like, again, that that type of problem is is omnipresent that, that uh, you know, whenever you're being syntactic, you know, the same thing can have different representations. Right. I mean, I, I, I mean, continue. I don't want to, I don't want to derail the top. So, so this bag example, I want to get back to um, sort of the cognitive science or linguistics motivation for type theory. Um, this example, you know, when you, when people do NLP and they take a document and they say abstract, you know, consider the bag of words, everyone understands that when you move from a document, which is a sequence of words, say, to the bag of words, you've lost information, right? You've lost the, you know, the sequence. Um, uh, so again, that's sort of pointing out that, that, that or at least to me, that indicates that, that um, this type theory is really integrated into sort of common sense, uh, very low level common sense understanding that this shift from a document to a bag where I can have a, you know, a room full of people and say, you know, each person has a country of orig origin, so there's a bag of countries. Um, uh, so again, it's just, I, I, I have this motivation for type theory as, as an explanation for sort of common sense understanding. Um, here's another thing that sort of comes out of my intuitions about common sense. So if we have um, a sort and I have, a, a, if I say consider a group, so I haven't said what group I'm talking about. And if I just say, consider a group, then the elements of that group should be thought of as points, right? As things without structure or consider a topological space. They should be thought of as points. Um, uh, but really what this means is I just don't know. When I say it's a group, I haven't committed to any, I haven't made any commitment as to what the group elements are. So this is just saying, I don't, I can't know. Um, there, for any possible um, value that the group elements could take, it's consistent with the context that it does take that value. Um, and then uh, representation. So uh, in programming, you have objects, in object-oriented programming, you have objects and interfaces. And there's the implementer that's building the object, the representation, and they see the representation. And then there's the consumer that's supposed to just see the abstract view. So in type theory, that distinction between programmer and user could be even be the same person, corresponds to whether um, the thing we're talking about is declared as a variable in the type. That's the user, the, 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 the sorts have to be points, um, or um, we're building an object um, with some representation. So for example, if I take some set and some additional structure and have a term that is a group, um, if I take an element of this group, so you know, if this was a group variable and I took an element of it, it would have to be a point. But if I built this group from some other set, then it's perfectly possible that its elements are functions. Okay, so I'm gonna end by saying, um, talking about work in progress. So um, I, I've been building a verification system directly on SAT solving SMT um, uh, technology. Um, so I'm freeing myself from, the, from, from having to construct proof terms in MLTT. Um, and uh, we, I've been talking um, with Mike Douglas about defining uh, the game of mathematics. You know, what is the game of mathematics such that we could make first steps toward 
um, something that learns mathematics through some kind of self-play, some kind of math zero. Um, and here's the primary, for me, I guess this is the primary takeaway. Um, mathematics is carried out in natural language, for example, English. Um, semantics, I like to think of semantics, Tarski and semantics as translating formal expressions into natural language. You say, here's a term, this term denotes, and then you say something in English. Or here's a formula, this formula is true if, and then you say something in English. So it's, and, and mathematicians are very, um, mathematical language is very platonic. They're talking, you know, it's talking about objects as if they actually exist. Um, and natural language mathematics, I can't help but think that, that colloquial mathematics reflects some structure of mental ease. Um, logic and uh, the, the lambda calculus, the second order lambda calculus, has historically played a central role in the semantics of natural language, a common sense natural language. Um, so another takeaway is that, is that um, this notion of grammatical well-formedness provides inferential power, the superpowers of isomorphism, the sub at least what we subjectively feel like the uh, powers of isomorphism. And finally, the Bourbaki type theory um, is intended at, as a model of the notion of well-formedness implicit in human mathematical language and thought, in colloquial mathematics. Um, so I'll end there and take questions. Great, right. thanks. Uh, questions from the audience? Uh, let's see, I, I mean, so just to see if that I, I understand, I mean, I mean, it's, it, as, as you say, you, 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 you have something precise enough that you could uh, encode this in a theorem proving system. But if you were to do that, you would presumably replace the semantic understanding of a set theory with, with some prover in set theory, right? And then you would have like uh, the, the type theory layer of, of proving things and the set theory layer of proving things. I mean, I guess you could, you could think of the set semantically, but then proofs are very, that's very inefficient, right? To check that uh, things are true semantically, right? Well, it's sort of like first order logic that um, there's lots of algorithmic. So I think of the implementation as being consisting of algorithms, yeah. like congruence closure. So if you think of congruence closure, it's more, it's, it seems more appropriate to think of it as an algorithm rather than but um, just, 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 just to, to, to check that I have to, I mean, it's like if you, we talked about like uh, resolution through improving, you would call that syntactic, right? I mean, that's yeah. What, yeah, yeah. And, and then that, true, there's, true, there's, true, a, and there's a resolution. Table. Right, and checking a truth table would be semantic. Right? Is that the kind of intuition I should have? Or? Well, I, the intuition is that the semantics defines the notion of correctness. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's some deeper sense of semantics where there are, there are true statements that are provable, and those are still true. But right, and that's and that's sort of what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah but but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm not going to replace the notion of correctness. The notion of correctness is semantic, and then an algorithm, you know, a particular verification system should be correct under yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, but then I mean, it's really one pragmatic. Thing a type theorist could tell you as well. Now you've got two layers in your system, and we do everything with just one type of, you know, deduct deduction. I mean, as a practical motivation. I mean, that that's it, it just, you know, again, and not as an outsider, it seems like many people that develop on you know interactive theorem proving systems are led to type theory, and that's the type of uh, motivation. Well, I view it as just um, not, so, so I, I, I phrased it as not requiring proof terms, right? So you don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be constrained to a particular set of inference rules and constructing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Proofs, it's that, then, exactly yeah. Right. 
I mean, another direction uh, you could you could take this. I mean, you're 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 mostly thinking in terms of com computer implementations, but you could try to come up with some sort of a psychological test. You know, if if it's really true that this is uh, you know aspects of this are language or thought, then you should have predictions about what people consider to be intuitive and what they don't consider to be intuitive. I mean, it's always very tricky when you're talking to trained subjects because you can sort of learn to think almost anything is intuitive, but at least uh, if, if, if you can ask questions of, of you know, you ask know, math questions to a physicist, uh, you know, they, <laughs> they're much more naive and, uh, you know, if it's intuitive to them, it's probably intuitive. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I, I really like the drive towards bringing mathematical semantics into the foundations. Um, but I'm, I haven't uh, really bought the sort of, from the mathematical point of view, privileging of set theory, even though it's historically central. Um, so maybe you can tell me what's wrong with an alternative approach to the semantics, which is to, um, you know, allow semantics of topological spaces, for example, to be represented by the category of topological spaces <clears throat> and to represent the type of topological spaces as a, as, a, as a combination, a pair or a triple of that category and an, <clears throat> an item in the uh, more st standard, um, uh, type theory, um, for example, um, in, their, in the Lambeck part of the correspondence, it would be an, an, a type would be an object in the category of types and terms or morphisms. <clears throat> so you can take one object in the category of types and one category, and that would be your new kind of higher level mathematical type. And um, I wonder, that, then, you, then uh, sets aren't sort of privileged anymore. So that that is I, I like that, but it might be able to uh, get some of the benefit that you're angling for, which is to bring the, as I understand it, to bring the semantics of mathematics, of real mathematics, into your type theory. Um. Well, let me, let me say a little bit about category theory um, and, and some discomfort I've had with that. So Eilenberg and McLean, their original paper on category theory used um, vector spaces as an example. You know, they said, um, uh, you know, there's no canonical basis for a vector space. And, and because of that, there's no canonical isomorphism between a vector space and its dual. And so to answer that, so he said, well, what do we mean by that? What do we mean when we say there's no canonical basis? Or, you know, it, it seems intuitively clear that there's no canonical point on a geometric circle. There, you know, there's rotational symmetry, all points are the same. And I've always felt like um, <clears throat> we understood that notion that there's no canonical basis or no canonical point on the circle. We already understood it, right? We, we, it's clearly true that there's no canonical basis for a vector space. Um, and that, that concept that there's no canonical basis for vector space is determined by the definition of vector space. You, don't, you shouldn't have to go define the category of linear transformations for that special case. There should be a uniform definition of canonical over all concepts. Um, and I, I'm not really answering your question. I know I'm not really answering your question, but for me, um, the direct naive meaning, I mean, it's not, you know, when I say um, a dependent pair type is, is a set of pairs, I haven't necessarily invoked all of ZFC or all of set theory or anything. I've just some, done something very intuitive, right? It's the, the, the this is the set of, you know, a set of pairs where one of them is this thing and one of them is that thing. Um, yeah. So I'm, I just, you know, 
I guess. Um, well, I, I, mean, I mean, category theory got used in many ways, but but I think uh, at you know, like Eilenberg and McLean, it was it was more trying to say here's this huge class of arguments that that use certain formal structures that you can uh, you know capture and make those arguments once and for all, you know, and and so it wasn't trying to explain uh, you know what 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 it meant to meant to to have a canonical choice or not to have a canonical choice. It was saying if you grant that there's no canonical element of a basis or canonical isomorphism between a space and its dual, you know, then here's a, here's a large set of arguments that, that uh, work with that. I mean, I, 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 I think you're right. People then took the idea of category theory in many ways, but it, I think that was the original motivation. But uh, I mean, I mean, maybe the, the larger point that Eric's Eric trying to make it, it, is that you could, you could replace that theory with another foundation, you know, and then, then you could use your framework to build on that foundation, you know, or maybe you could even say, let's, let's compare two foundations set theory and uh, some interpretation of category theory and show that they have equal expressiveness within this framework. Well, um, I mean, I guess, I guess another question is um, getting back to the cognitive science motivation. Um, if, the, if the point is to gain insight into thinking, then the, then the, then the question would be, do we believe that, um, or, or what, what sort of formal models are good models of human mm -hmm. life? Well, for that, the attraction of category theory is that's analogies all the way up. It's objects and analogies. We, we, we uh, think about everything, in about a lot of things in terms of objects, even when they're not objects. So we turn processes into objects. And then we try to move experience with one uh, in one domain into another. And that's where sort of morphisms and functors and natural transformations all kind of fit into that agenda. So that's the nice thing about category theory from the point of view of maybe cognition. But I, I certainly I wouldn't say they're also not unnice things about it. <clears throat> oh, oh, those are also, I, I certainly agree with those nice things. Um, uh, so, I mean, in this setting, you, you still have um, functors and concepts and, and you know, um, yeah. that's absolutely critical to mathematical thinking. Right. More questions? Okay, well, why don't we uh, call the uh, formal seminar, uh, bring it to a close, uh, and we'll thank uh, David for enlightening uh, talk. I feel I understand more about uh, type theory and set theory now. So uh, next week, we'll have uh, Miles Cramer from uh, the uh, astrophysics at uh, Princeton, who will tell us about uh, machine learning for determining the uh, stability of uh, planetary systems. And I hope to see you all there. So we'll stop the recording.